Good morning. My name is Neil Shader and I am the Press Secretary for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. This morning we will be discussing the results of a survey of farmers in the Chesapeake Bay watershed to identify on the ground best management practices that have been implemented voluntarily and at the landowner's expense. This morning we will be joined by Acting Secretary of the Department of, Ag or the Department of Environmental Protection, Patrick McDonald, Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Russell Redding, Matt Royer, Director of the Agriculture and Environment Center at Penn State University, and Rich Patuk, Associate Director at the EPA Chesapeake Bay Program Office. Our agenda for this morning is on your screen now. We'll start the presentation off with remarks from Secretary McDonald and Secretary Redding, then go into the survey results and implications for the watershed. At the conclusion of the presentation, we'll take questions from accredited media only. Reporters that wish to ask a question can enter it in the Q&A box on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Please put your name and affiliated media in the box along with your questions when they are submitted. Secretary? Excellent. Uh, th thank you all for joining this discussion. The Pennsylvania Chesapeake Bay Watershed Farmer Survey represents an exciting and innovative partnership of government, agriculture, and the academic community. The team assembled here today reflects a spirit of collaboration and this project demonstrates the success that can result. Uh, for background, a year ago, DEP and the Department of Agriculture joined with Penn State and other stakeholders to conduct a comprehensive voluntary survey to locate, quantify, and verify best management practices that farmers are voluntarily implementing to reduce nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment levels entering our streams and rivers and ultimately the Chesapeake Bay. In short, what actions do farmers take on their own to help clean local waters? The survey, which you'll hear more about in detail uh, from Matt Royer from Penn State in a moment, uh, included farmer self-reporting, followed by an on-site verification. DEP provided funding for the survey and technical training for Penn State Cooperative Extension personnel who conducted the on-site farm visits. The survey results are important for three reasons. First, they confirm that Pennsylvania farmers are doing water quality protection work that has previously been unaccounted for and can be factored into the documentation and verification of Pennsylvania's progress on its Chesapeake Bay watershed goals. Second, these results underscore that our water protection strategies and programs must be based on good, accurate data. This is necessary to our ability to target resources to meet the recommendations and action items put forth last January by Governor Wolf in Pennsylvania's Bay Restoration Strategy. Moreover, having accurate data is key to developing Pennsylvania's Phase 3 Watershed Implementation Plan, ensuring a plan that is accurate, realistic, and implementable. Finally, the survey protocol is replicable, giving us a reliable method for documenting farmers' best management practices in the future as we work to ensure that all efforts are counted in charting Pennsylvania's progress on meeting its Bay Watershed goals. Uh, we still have a big hill to climb in meeting our Bay obligations and, and improving water quality uh, in the backyards of Pennsylvanians uh, across the watershed. But I think the survey is an important tool uh, to have in the toolbox in, in order to ensure that we will ultimately get there. And we're, we are very pleased to be able to share these results with you today. I'll now turn it over to uh, Secretary Russell Redding, Department of Agriculture, for some brief remarks. Mr. Secretary, thank you and good morning, uh, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in, in the uh, webinar and, and to share results. Um, as the Secretary noted, I mean, this has really been an important effort for Pennsylvania. Uh, I, I want to just say at the outset, uh, appreciate very much uh, Department of Environmental Protection assistance with this, uh, and for those who've been around this conversation for some time, understand that this is unprecedented uh, in that we've taken uh, a concern that's been raised in the agricultural community uh, and, and others uh, across time, uh, and that is really what is happening voluntarily. We understand well what's covered uh, and what the practices that are implemented based on things that we pay for, but what about the everyday good management practices that are being done uh, in agriculture? And, Today we know more uh, about what that is and what it looks like and uh, pleased to be part of the effort to do it. Uh, but it wouldn't have happened without many stakeholders. Uh, and it began with a simple question from the agricultural community to uh, DEP 
uh, and that is, uh, could, could you survey? And that discussion began uh, a really uh, a very positive engagement with uh, many stakeholders to include conservation districts, the EPA, uh, the farm organizations, to include the Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, uh, the Penn Ag Industries, the professional dairy managers, uh, among others. And, and really unprecedented, uh, even for those of us who, who work in agriculture every day, to have that type of cooperation on, uh, on this issue. So thank you uh, to the organizations and to the department. But importantly, it wouldn't have happened without a credible partner to do it, uh, both in terms of, of uh, the agencies, but uh, our land grant university and, and trust them. We work with them. We've got a uh, hundred plus years of uh, experience in working with the agricultural community and Pennsylvanians. Uh, so very pleased to have Dean Roush, uh, Dr. Jim Shortle, and Matt Royer, who were the principals at Penn State, uh, to make this happen. So just a note of thanks to them. A couple of key points here. Uh, I noted the, the experience, and, and I say positive because it was positive in terms of the development of uh, what to do, positive in terms of the, the process that ensued to get uh, the survey constructed, uh, distributed, and returned, and to be on this side of the process and have really important outcomes, both in terms of participation by the farm community, but also for the first time uh, a, a better handle on the practices and very specifically uh, the acreage and some of the metrics attached to the practices that we speak of, we have that. Uh, this is an important part of the strategy. As we've said from the beginning, we have more work to do, uh, but uh, it's predicated on having a good understanding of what we've already done. And this is a key answer to that, right? What have we done and what can we expect folks to do? Uh, we have said uh, if we want folks to do more, we should at least give them credit for what they've already done. And, and that's part of this strategy, so we know that today. We follow through on a very simple promise, and that is if we're going to do uh, more in the state uh, to get the reductions, uh, we also have to make sure that we're engaging the right stakeholders, we're, we're giving them credit for what they're doing, but we're really making sure that we have the full partnership of the land grant, uh, our local government, state government, uh, and our federal uh, partners as well in that conversation. Uh, we have uh, noted, uh, and we think this uh, survey allows for a real meaningful conversation about the, the farm level plans, what's being done, what are the best practices, uh, where are they being applied, uh, and how are they being applied so we can take the next step as we talk about additional planning uh, and additional conservation efforts is so that we can point to these results as both evidence of what's being done as good practice but also uh, as a great place to start conversation about uh, where other producers and farmers have to uh, focus their efforts as well. Uh, we uh, know that the uh, data here will help guide us in, uh, in, in the metrics of, of how we measure uh, progress and how we measure success. Uh, we think that's an important outcome of this as well. And most importantly, I think, uh, is that the beneficiaries of this work are the land and water quality in the communities of Pennsylvania, because uh, we can really uh, demonstrate that uh, the landscape has changed, uh, that farmers are, uh, have been and are committed to conservation and really have a culture of, of uh, stewardship. Uh, so we're pleased to, to be partners in this. We understand from an industry and a department that we have uh, done a great job uh, to date, but there's also more to do, and this survey helps us uh, uh, define what we need to do and who needs to be in, in the conversation going forward. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you. Uh, very pleased, uh, Matt Royer, as I noted, uh, one of the principals here, director of the Agricultural Environmental Center at uh, Penn State University, um, is uh, going to share the results. Matt? Thank you, Secretary Redding. Um, thank you, Secretary uh, McDonald, uh, for the opportunity to partner with you on this project. Um, we feel it's a very important project for the Commonwealth, um, and it demonstrates some really good work and a lot of resources uh, being put in the ground and own dollars by farmers to implement conservation. Um, also want to thank, uh, before I could dive into the results, uh, all the partners that that we worked with to develop this project and the survey itself, in particular uh, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau and Penn Ag Industries and Professional Dairy 
managers in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Association of Conservation District, and others within the agricultural community. It was a true, true partnership, and uh, we were happy to uh, offer our areas of expertise in, in agriculture and extension and outreach and research uh, uh, to this project. Um, also want to thank within, within the uh, university and the college, Dean Rausch and uh, Director of Extension, Dennis Calvin, for supporting the initiative. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Jim, Jim Shortle being uh, one of the uh, key uh, data analysts, uh, Aaron Cook, our key research assistant, uh, Chris Hauser from Extension and over 40 other Extension agents at Penn State that played a role in the verification. Uh, finally, the Survey Research Center at Penn State for administering the survey. So a lot of, lot of hands in this, um, and we really, really appreciate it. Uh, so getting to the, um, uh, getting to the slides, um, we asked questions about approximately 11 different conservation practices in this survey. So you see the list here. Now we understand that there are many more types of practices that are implemented on the farm. Uh, we really kind of chose zone in on these for purposes of the survey to choose priority practices that achieve high levels of nutrient sediment reductions. Um, those that we anticipated having a pretty high rate of volunteer, voluntary implementation. Um, so in other words, practices we could capture that hadn't been, uh, hadn't been documented before, and those that are um, or have a good reason to be accepted into the Chesapeake Bay uh, model for crediting of Pennsylvania's progress. So uh, the, the survey itself was administered by the Survey Research Center at Penn State, which provides uh, support to university researchers in survey-based research, um, and they were able to help us tremendously in uh, developing the survey, printing it out, uh, developing a web option for returning the survey, uh, and really handled all the administration of the survey. The survey ran in the early part of this year from, uh, it was launched in late January, it ran through April 30th, which was a good time to send surveys to farmers um, during that winter period. Uh, we had a very good response rate. It was, it was mailed out to an internal farmer mailing list of approximately 20,000, and uh, we received close to 7,000 survey returns. You can see the exact number there. A 35% response rate, and for a voluntary survey, uh, the research set, Survey Research Center, which does this work a lot, said this was an extremely high response rate. And we can really credit uh, the partners, uh, not only the agencies, but in particular the ag, ag partners, the farm, farmer organizations that really pushed the importance of filling out this survey with their membership. So once we have the survey returns in, um, we needed to uh, look at that data to see how accurate we could, uh, confident we could be in the accuracy of the data. And so in order to do this, we developed a verification process and we um, pulled randomly 10% of the survey returns that were then selected for farm visits. And we had Penn State Extension uh, conduct those visits um, to assess the inventory results and help us further analyze the data. Uh, so we uh, selected agents who have a high level of experience working on farms and within agriculture. So these would be our extension folks who are trained in agronomy and nutrient management, livestock, and those kind of things with, with degrees in that area. And they work in this arena daily uh, in their county offices or in our university park office offices. Um, so over 40 agents were involved in that. We worked then with, with the department's uh, DEP and, 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 and PDA and the State Conservation Commission, along with support from the Chesapeake Bay Program Office and county conservation districts in particular, the Lancaster County Conservation District helped us tremendously to develop a training uh, so that we, we would know that the staff was fully trained on um, assessing these best management practices, were trained on the protocols and standards that are expected at the Chesapeake Bay uh, uh, program, and then uh, were able to go out on these farms and record data assessed through their farm visits. 
that on a farm visit report that we could then compare to the actual survey results and be able to assess the accuracy. So that allowed us to look at that accuracy. Um, and uh, another, another point here before I get into the results of that analysis, we were able to provide uh, results cumulatively and, and do that on a county basis. Um, and this will allow the department to report these results to the Chesapeake Bay program in the, in the format that they accept that data. And at the same time, keep all of the information confidential. So we have nothing within the data that's uh, being provided to, to DEP or, or anything uh, even to the researchers, quite frankly, that shows any indication of the individual farmers and location of the farms. Uh, we really just looked at this data uh, from a cumulative statistical standpoint and uh, protecting, therefore, the confidentiality of those farmers submitting the data, which is very, very important to us and important to the agricultural community as well. We also looked at and asked questions within the survey that uh, can avoid a problem of double counting best management practices, that is, practices that might be reported uh, in other manners that DEP is already reporting to the Chesapeake Bay program, such as government cost share program funded practices, we, we were able to net those out from our analysis. We're able to also net out practices that are captured through other state regulatory programs and other data collection mechanisms. So narrowing then that down to a subset of practices that we asked about, here is, um, here are those practices that we really have zoned in on for purposes of this report uh, as being practices that previously weren't, haven't been counted and also would be considered voluntary non-cost share practices that farmers are implementing themselves. So these were the practices that the farm visits focused on and the, um, the extension agents gathered data on these practices. And then it allowed us to compare the results. And really what we found was that we were able to have a large enough with the 10% sampling, which was over 700 farms visited through the months of August and September. Um, we were able to have a large enough sample size to analyze that data. Uh, the one practice you don't see on there that we are reporting kind of raw numbers to DEP is manure transport, that is transport of manure between um, two counties within the Bay Watershed or outside of the Bay Watershed. Next slide. So what we found when we looked at the difference between the survey responses and the farm visit reports, we, we, and we did this individually for each BMP, um, I have two sample graphs here for two different BMPs. We found that for all BMPs, uh, with the exception I'll talk about in one moment, um, that the statistical analysis revealed this is very accurate data. The farmers are reporting accurately the, the BMPs that they have on the farms, and in fact, if there's anything, there's an, a trend toward an underreporting, that the farmers might be a little conservative in what they're reporting based on what we far, found in the farm visits. Uh, the one exception to that was riparian buffers, uh, where we found a systematic overreporting. And because of our data analysis, we were able to adjust the numbers to reflect this. Um, I want to explain wh what we feel is the reason for that because it's very important, I think, in that it really doesn't reflect a farmer over-reporting, we believe, but has rather to do with how the questions were asked on the survey versus how the farm visits, the extension agents were trained to collect the data during the farm visits. Um, and that, what I mean by that is we have two questions related to buffers. One is stream bank fencing. The other is a question about riparian buffers. And we asked farmers to report all of their riparian buffer acres in answer to the riparian buffer question. Uh, whereas when the extension agents were trained, because of the Chesapeake Bay program protocols on these practices, they were trained to record the buffers created by stream bank fencing in answer to the stream bank fencing question, and then all other buffers not, not produced by stream bank fencing in answer to the buffer question. So we think it has more to do with 
how the data was recorded by the farm visits as opposed to a true over reporting by the farmers. But either way, our data analysis allows us to adjust for that over reporting and be comfortable in reporting uh, the number of riparian buffer acres as well. So final slide is to share with you the cumulative results of these practices. And you can see they are, they are fairly significant. Um, you know, just to highlight a few, we have over 2,000 barnyard runoff control systems that farmers have installed, again, with their own dollars, um, that have not been previously counted, accounted for in the model. We have, uh, even with those adjustments of riparian buffer acres, um, 1,750 plus acres of grass riparian buffers, almost 6,000 acres of forest riparian buffers. Again, all of these being installed by farmers with their own dollars, uh, almost one and a half million linear feet of stream bank fencing. So these are significant numbers. Um, and we, uh, again, to reiterate a uh, point made by uh, uh, Secretary Redding, uh, this does not mean the agriculture community is, is finished. There's, there's still a lot of work to be done. But we, we do feel that this does help us uh, move the dial, uh, move down the, the, the field a little further in terms of fully giving farmers credit for what they've installed on their farms. We will now go to uh, Rich Batuk from the EPA joining us on the phone. Rich, are you with us? Yep, I'm here. All right. So back in October of 2014, the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership agreed to a basin-wide framework for how to ensure um, not only agricultural conservation practices, but practices reported by counties, by municipalities, by individual homeowners, businesses, that those practices were confirmed to be in place and functioning. And that was our basin-wide BMP verification framework. An important piece of that is that we've got buy-in from all six states, the District of Columbia, folks in our business community, agricultural community of how do we, what are the fair uh, rules out there to ensure as these practices, as described by Matt, um, are actually out there functioning and, and doing the good work that they are uh, to protecting local streams and rivers and eventually the Chesapeake. Um, EPA is very pleased to, to, to let folks know that the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnerships Agricultural Work Group um, approved Pennsylvania's extremely innovative approaches to better accounting for what farmers are doing to, run, to reduce runoff of nutrients and sediments to local waters in the Chesapeake. The, the, the framework that's set up by Penn State and described by Matt will now be appended to the document that the partnership agreed to back in 2014. And not only Pennsylvania, but all six states can use that to, to better understand the non-cost share practices, the great work that our, our farmers and producers are putting on the ground out there, but hadn't been accounted for previously through uh, cost share programs as well. So again, thanks to Penn State and our Pennsylvania State Agency colleagues for making that work happen as well out there. Next slide. So one of the things folks uh, have referred to is taking these agricultural conservation practices and other practices and feeding the model per se. Well, the partnership uh, doesn't depend on a single model. It's a very complex ecosystem out there with 18 million people. Beyond Pennsylvania's 33,000 farmers, we've got about 74,000 across all six states out there. We've got uh, hundreds of wastewater treatment facilities. So the partnership uses a suite of models to understand what's the relative effects of not only uh, what's being reported in this particular survey, but what's happening around the globe in terms of reducing nitrogen oxides, for example, coming from places as far away as China or from the Midwest itself. So we actually use a series of models looking at air quality issues, what's changed, what's changed in the land, what's happening in our watershed, um, what's hap what, get, what loads get into the Chesapeake Bay itself, and then other important uh, items like oysters and menhaden, things that are actively filter feeding within the Chesapeake Bay itself. The importance of these practices um, collected by the partners, uh, including Pennsylvania, over the past 30 years, and now with the results of this survey, we're getting a much better understanding of what's happening on the land. We can ensure that these suites of models, drawn from a tremendous amount of science from our land-grant universities like Penn State and others, um, are guided by monitoring data, 
but also what are the changes in the land and what are the history of those practices over time. So this, this survey will enhance the latest versions, particularly the partnerships watershed model, now in its sixth generation over the last three decades, to better understand and to provide a better tool, not to make decisions for us, but to inform how we're making local to regional to six state level decisions as well. Next slide, please. These practices, along with other types of information on what's happening in terms of the local scale in terms of land use and land cover. Where are the septic systems out there? Where are those 18 million people located? Where are those Walmart parking lots? Where do we have contiguous forest out there? These practices uh, on an annual year um, until this survey, our six state partners in the district submitted an annually around 14,000 individual practices, including agricultural conservation practices. That's adding to a database over the last two decades of over 200,000 individual practices, both annual practices and practices that are put in, in place for a long time period. As Matt indicated, with this survey, we will be able to enrich that data system. We'll better understand what Pennsylvania farmers have, have been doing recently in terms of getting good practices in, the, in place there. And again, our understanding of what kind of progress uh, Pennsylvania farmers have had out there will then be better accounted for. We can still do better. As Matt indicated, um, we had a, a great 7,000, almost 7,000 farmers have responded. We'd like to continue this work uh, with this excellent innovative survey technique into the future to continue to, to get a better understanding of getting up to those 33,000 farmers and what's out there. That information can only help us individually and collectively make better decisions and credit where credit is due, where there's been good hard-earned dollars that are going on the ground um, in buffers, in nutrient management, in manure transport that's making a difference in, in local streams and rivers and in the Chesapeake, as we'll talk about in a minute. Next slide, please. So speaking of progress out there, we are fortunate both in the watershed and in our tidal waters to have coming up on into our fourth decade of monitoring data. Within Pennsylvania alone, we've got a, a network of 30 plus stations along the Susquehanna, the Geniata, the North Branch, into smaller rivers and creeks along Pennsylvania's uh, river system out there. These samples are, are collected both by Susquehanna River Basin Commission, Pennsylvania DEP staff, as well as U.S. Geological Survey. And it's part of a larger network covering all six states in the district. And then below the mighty Susquehanna and where Pennsylvania contributes into the Potomac, we're also fortunate in the Chesapeake Bay Tidal Waters to have a, a network, again, coordinated by the larger partnership of about 160 stations, operated by Maryland, Virginia, D.C., and Delaware, and universities from University of Maryland, Virginia Marine Science, Old Dominion University, University of Delaware. And the overwhelming answer that they're coming back after looking at now into coming up into our fourth decade is our streams, our rivers, and our Chesapeake Bay are responding. They're responding to the practices that Matt showed up here in terms of that we haven't accounted for previously. Um, they are responding to the, the good work that townships and boroughs in Pennsylvania are doing with their wastewater, with their stormwater efforts. Um, but we are seeing the signal of the good practices that farmers are putting in place in the Commonwealth, in the place what we really want, not just in our models, but in our actual stream and river samples that are out there as well. Our USGS colleagues, the results that you're seeing here are essentially long-term trends when you've accounted for uh, the changes in weather patterns out there, whether it's cold winters or big thunderstorms in the summer, against that, that those changing patterns in weather out there, we're able to see significant long-term trends of nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment. Those loads in our streams and rivers are going down. And as you can see in the, in the right-hand side in the Chesapeake Bay itself, I would never thought I would see it in my 30 years of, of working with the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership, but for most of that Chesapeake, the amount of nitrogen in the system, in this case in the surface waters, are heading down. That means that you have to have had a lot of reductions on the lands, particularly in the mighty Susquehanna and Pennsylvania's portion of the Potomac, in order to see those significant trends. But that's not all we've seen. Next slide, please. And that is, in the last several years, our scientific community has said that the Chesapeake ecosystem in the watershed seems to be um, sort of on the edge of taking some significant steps towards restoration. More resilience, the fact that we can see the Susquehanna Flats and the, and the grass beds there right at the, at the head uh, as the Susquehanna enters in the Chesapeake Bay, 
It's one of the only underwater grass beds you can actually see from space up there. It went from a few thousand acres to up to 12 to 13,000 acres now. Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania farmers can take a lot of credit for that particular work. We've seen some of the clearest waters in the Chesapeake in the last several years, and we've seen for decades out there. That means that nutrients are not coming into the system and causing harmful algal blooms. That means important soil is, keep, is kept on our farm fields and the backyards of our, our neighborhoods, and it's not coming in and clogging up our streams and rivers. Um, we are seeing better harvest of crabs. We are seeing record numbers of underwater grasses. Oysters are coming back. Collectively, the Chesapeake Bay, Pennsylvania's 33,000 farmers are making a difference out there. As Matt has indicated, uh, Secretary Redding mentioned, Secretary McDonald, are we there yet? No. But we clearly see from the evidence of monitoring, and it's backed up an important role that our, our BMP practices play, as that is explaining the trends that I showed you up there as well. So we need those practices not just to run in and use to help decision-making through models, we also use those set sets of conservation practices that now are available to, uh, to the partnership through the good work of Penn State um, to actually explain the long-term trends we're seeing out there so we can give credit to what's happening on Fishing Creek and, and on uh, Conestoga and the Conewago um, in terms of the good work that's happening on the land up there as well. So due to the sheer number, magnitude of uh, farms in Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth now has a partnership agreed to, innovative and efficient way to account for these agricultural practices that farmers are uh, employing on their farms without the value of cost share. This farm-based survey is with such a success due to the, the agricultural community's willingness to share data and information with people that they trust um, in a way that, so that we understood what was happening on their farms, but we protected uh, their business confidential information. Your colleagues at EPA applaud Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Ag, Pennsylvania Farm Bureau, Penn, uh, Penn Ag Industries, and Penn State University for working together to make this happen. This is the first time in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. This is now a, an accredited approach that other states can take advantage of. We feel that having a more complete accounting for conservation practices uh, on the landscape will not only give credit to the farmers for what they deserve that we have not accounted for, uh, but now we have a tool to do so but it also allows our Pennsylvania colleagues to determine how to focus the important resources out there to continue to keep the pace going, get ag practices on the ground, continue the, sending that cleaner water down the Susquehanna, down the Potomac, and eventually meet their goals along with their other state partners as well. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we will take questions from accredited media. Uh, reporters that wish to ask a question can enter it in the Q&A box on the lower right-hand side of your screen. Again, please put your name and affiliated media in the box along with your questions as they are submitted. Our first question comes from Rona Kobel of the Chesapeake Bay Journal. Uh, Rona asks about uh, nitrate levels, uh, particularly in the Octoraro watershed, which is in uh, sort of southeast, south central Pennsylvania. Uh, the question is, are you focused on the nitrates in drinking water, and what are you doing to engage plain sect farmers uh, about drinking water issues downstream? Uh, did the survey show more practices than expected there, and will there be a focused effort uh, because it's been an area of concern? Uh, Matt, if you'd like sure, to I, I can I can take a shot at that, uh, Rona. So um, we obviously our our this goes a little beyond the scope of our our project, but at the same time there's there's some relevance here. Um, we were asking questions about practices implemented that certainly would control and reduce uh, nitrogen, and therefore have have an impact on. Uh, ultimately, nitrates in, in drinking water, um, and and we uh, distributed the survey uh, bay wide, so bay watershed wide, um, with with the opportunity of uh, responses you know, certainly coming in from this this priority area. Uh, I I can't say for sure um, uh, because we haven't looked at the data other than on a county basis. 
um, the amount of information or survey information that we've, we've seen come in from this particular watershed. I can tell you that based on the county data, and the map I did throw up there briefly shows that Lancaster County, uh, which includes the Octorora watershed in the eastern part of the county, was by far and away the largest county in terms of number of responses we've received. Uh, we do know that there's a large number of planes sacked in that county, so uh, while we, we had no way of telling which farmer was plain sacked or English or what the case may be, um, I, I have strong confidence that uh, we had a lot of plain sec responding to our, to our survey. Um, I will also say that with some of the questions that you ask, um, you know, our, the, what we're reporting today is a small part of the information we can glean from this survey. This is an extremely, extremely rich data set. And we plan to continue looking at the data uh, to help us form some answers to questions like you've been asked, asking, where can we focus our efforts in the future? What farm types are implementing practices at higher rates than other farm types? Who's, what kind of farms are taking advantage of cost share programs and which types and which aren't? Uh, these are the kind of things we can analyze as well, which we haven't done to date. We've been focused on the, basically the reportable practices. But we plan to do that over the next year, is really dig into that data. So you will be seeing some additional reports from us coming out over the next year um, related to you know, some of the questions that you raised. Uh, and this, this is uh, Pat McDonald. Just uh, a, a couple things I would say. Uh, one, I think on, on the, the very specific and, and technical piece, uh, we are actually in the process of working with stakeholders to revise the, the total maximum discharge limit uh, for the watershed, working with, with uh, the two county conservation districts as well as the Water Authority and other stakeholders to do that. But I, I, I also want to point out, I think the, the question highlights uh, a, a couple things, and that is one, that uh, we want to be very focused on the data and where the data takes us in terms of um, uh, kind of maximizing the impact we can have for, for the resources that we have. And two, I'll, I'll just point out, and this is uh, something that my, my staff has heard me, uh, I'll, I'll say, challenge them a bit with, and that is um, uh, what, I, what I refer to as figuring out the right message and right messenger um, uh, as we get into each of the various areas that we need to engage in here. And so, you know, Plain sect is a different area of farming than, than, than uh, agriculture more generally. So figuring out what are effective strategies uh, to engage with, with those communities is one of those things that, that um, we definitely need to be thoughtful about uh, as we move forward. Thank you. A question from Phil Gruber of Lancaster Farming uh, about the survey. How will the survey results be updated over time? Well, I, I think... Um, this is Matt Royer. Sure, this is Matt Royer from Penn State. Um, you know, at this point, we, as I, as I had mentioned, we, um, we kind of have a phase one report here in terms of what we're reporting out now. Uh, we do have an opportunity to look at some of the other data that we haven't uh, dug into uh, and offer some... Uh, uh, some reports coming out uh, related to some of the other questions regarding the um, the trajectory of conservation on farms in the Chesapeake Bay watershed in Pennsylvania. Um, other than that, you know, there's probably some additional discussion uh, now that this methodology has been approved as an acceptable methodology to use moving forward um, as to how how we take advantage of that approval moving forward. It's a conversation and discussions that, quite frankly, uh, we haven't been involved with to date, but we'd be very happy to continue the opportunities to say, um, can this survey methodology be, be utilized into the future? I, I, this is Russell um, Redding. I would just add, given uh, uh, Rich Patuk's uh, note about the inclusion of um, this methodology as part of the, uh, the model uh, and in endorsed by the working group uh, gives us confidence that it both is recognized as, uh, as a statistically significant and, and a really good tool 
you know, for the Chesapeake Bay watershed, uh, that that, uh, I think, really um, speaks to the need to, the value of doing it initially, of course, but also the need to continue, uh, both for Pennsylvania and do, do the appropriate follow-up here. Uh, just from uh, the department's perspective, you know, if you had asked us on the front side to guess uh, on the practices we, we may be able to get you uh, pretty close on those priority practices just looking at the landscape, but we would not have uh, you know, uh, noted you know, things like the linear fence, uh, over a million linear feet of fencing. I mean, that is significant. I mean, that is one of those high priority practices that we speak of. So, uh, Phil, to, to the point, I think you're raising the right question that uh, we have results, we can build from the results, we'll to do some further analysis of, of the results, but having it embedded in the uh, methodology now really legitimizes both the use of it in the Bay Watershed, but uh, will give us uh, uh, a good point to uh, go forward in terms of how we approach it methodically at the, the state level in the years to come. Yeah, and, and this is uh, Pat McDonald. I, I would just add uh, two things. One. I think it's, it's um, as I said at the, the outset, we, we certainly have a hill to climb here. So one, we need to be very focused on the highest priority areas. So the better data we have, better understanding of what we have going out on the ground, uh, uh, that's important. I think two, and just as important, is this survey tool gives us a means by which, in a cost-effective way, we can get that data without without a lot of uh, on-the-ground farm-by-farm uh, work. That we can have have a general understanding of what is happening out there, so we can be properly focused in those areas that where where we still need to address issues. Thank you. Our next question comes from Ben Allen of WITF. Uh, Pennsylvania has lagged behind other states in the watershed. Do these results catch Pennsylvania up or are we still uh, behind? I, I, I think the, the, the answer is, is frankly one of we have um, significant progress we still need to make, as, as do I think all, all of the, the Bay states. You know, no, none of us are there yet. Um, uh, Pennsylvania has uh, the, the largest landmass by far kind of impacting uh, the Bay watershed itself. Uh, we have by far more farms uh, than, than any of this other states, um, you know, particularly as you look in the Lancaster area. So th there's certainly uh, work to do. We're in the midst of uh, what we refer to as a you know, midpoint assessment, uh, recalibration of the Chesapeake Bay model. So I think there'll be more information to come in terms of exactly where we stand, but this becomes uh, a tool that factors into uh, our, our understanding of exactly where we sit. Yeah, this is Rich Patuk. I want to build up on what uh, Secretary McDonald indicated. If you look at the, our best indication of the progress that Pennsylvania, both in the Susquehanna and the Potomac, have made, the monitoring data results that, that um, all of us have benefited from from the past 30 plus years of sampling indicate very good news for Pennsylvania nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment um, going down in a lot of streams and rivers out there. But if you compare that with, uh, and I don't want to get ahead of us too much, as, as Secretary McDonald mentioned, the partnership is taking a step back, um, looking at the implementation to date under our Chesapeake Bay TMDL, or our, our pollution diet out there. Uh, Pennsylvania is heading in the right direction, but even from the monitoring data's sake, we know that they've got some more work to do. But all, all the remaining five jurisdictions in the district also have got more work to do out there as well. But with these, these the, the results of these surveys will help us interpret what's happening on the Octorero, as uh, Rona had asked earlier. We'll have a better understanding of what's behind these monitoring trends. How much is due to wastewater treatment plant upgrades? What uh, can we recognize that, that the farmers putting on the ground out there, here's their part of that piece. And what has happened because of good Clean Air Act out there, or as well as Pennsylvania continues its work on on stormwater. So I think those the the results from the from the survey continue to fill out as as uh, Secretary McDonald mentioned, getting a more robust set of data um, to match up with these long term monitoring trends, with enhanced uh, tools of our models uh, and understanding of that, and then collectively being able to set a good course collectively for Pennsylvania, but also, also at a much more regional and local scale. So I think we're, Pennsylvania is moving in the right direction, 
um, has acknowledged that it's got some bigger challenges, certainly on the farming, farming and agricultural side than anyone else, just because of the sheer magnitude. But it's got some of the strongest trends as well out there. So we've got a good trajectory. We need to continue it out there and use all the collective tools and, and data in front of us to support our, our colleagues up in the Commonwealth. Thank you, Rich. A uh, question from Monica Vendovnik from the Reading Eagle. Uh, it seems that the farmers who answered the survey might be the ones who are most likely to have those best management practices on the ground. How do you plan to reach the other farmers in the region? Yeah, Monica, hi. Uh, Russell Redding here, just uh, uh, picking up on a couple of uh, themes of, of the last questions. I think, first of all, uh, it, this goes back to the stakeholder base that we built at the outset. Right, that this was really done on a foundation of buy-in from the agricultural community. It was a request that they had made uh, and a request that was honored. Uh, and the expectation now will be that, that they share these results, they can point to the results, they can point to the credibility of the study. Uh, and I think it begins to build a level of trust with the community that to date has been fairly critical of, uh, of not acknowledging or the state and the program not acknowledging what was being done on the voluntary effort. So uh, I think the stakeholders uh, will certainly do that. Uh, Penn State University and to my point earlier about having a land grant institution that has a long history of, of uh, work in uh, our counties and across the state uh, and, and takes the research and, and education and transitions and transfers that to, to the farm, uh, in this case farm community, will be important. Uh, and uh, I think for the inclusion of this in the model is a statement of the uh, value that we see in the effort, right? This, this isn't simply an exercise of let's go check, right? Uh, we have launched over a year uh, work, uh, institution, uh, Penn State went out, 42 people to verify this. Um, if you want to point to uh, for the farmers who may not have responded uh, at all or may not be doing the practices, you end up with two really important outcomes. One uh, is that there was a sincerity in uh, the state wanting to know and a great response for those who are being asked the question to respond to it, right? Two is we can actually point to a list of very specific practices uh, that are really good practices that we can uh, acknowledge are, are there that are happening uh, and hope would be that we can, uh, through continued survey efforts, build our uh, data file, if you will, of, of what is being done voluntarily. But we can also say that we, we, we sincerely want to know, we want to include that in the model, and the model is going to count it. Uh, so that's going to certainly have a positive impact on the agricultural community's outlook of the effort of our strategy generally uh, and the contributions that they can make individually to their own good management practices uh, every day. So. Uh, I, I think this really is a tipping point in the conversation about how we approach our strategy and how we acknowledge the work of the farm community in Pennsylvania. And whether you're in uh, my uh, home county of Adams or, or you're somewhere in the further reaches of, of uh, uh, the Bay, uh, you can have some confidence that ag is now counted, um, both in terms of what is uh, cost share because we have a good record but now for the first time a uh, methodology including the voluntary uh, practices. So you end up with both count and voluntary to get you a total. And that's really been um, speculated over the years as to what it is, but now we have some confirmation it's significant. And uh, this is uh, Pat McDonnell again. I'll, I'll, I'll just add briefly, I think it's also important to realize uh, uh, the survey results are very important, but there's also context, uh, and that is, the larger effort that we have going on uh, to address water quality issues within the Susquehanna River watershed, the Potomac watershed, and, and really throughout uh, Pennsylvania. So uh, the survey is one of the tools. Uh, we've had good engagement with our conservation districts on, on being out on farms and, and understanding what's going on out there. We've had good engagement with various stakeholders within the agricultural community, uh, good engagement with uh, uh, townships, boroughs, counties on these issues. So uh, this is a part of the story. It's not the entirety of the story, but all of it is important for us to get to what is the most important data, which is 
reduction in nitrogen, reduction in phosphorus, reduction in sediment uh, throughout the watershed. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you, Secretary Redding. Thank you to Matt Royer and, uh, and everyone on the phone. Um, at this point, we're going to wrap things up. The uh, slide deck that we presented today will be made available on the DEP website shortly, uh, and a recording of this webinar will be made available as well. Uh, thank you all for participating, and have a good weekend. <laughs>